Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator at McNally Robinson Booksellers. Uh, we're broadcasting tonight from Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Metis Nation. Um, before we begin tonight, uh, there are certain recent news events that will of necessity uh, presumably arise as points of discussion during this event. Uh, with that in mind, and with the knowledge that such discussion can amplify and elongate existing trauma, I'd encourage all so triggered and impacted to take very good care of yourselves and reach out if help is needed. I'll add some information on resources in the chat, and the same information may be found beneath the text of the video on our YouTube channel. Uh, to be more specific, it would be churlish to proceed without acknowledging the atrocious news out of uh, Kawissa's First Nation, and before that, of course, out of Kamloops. I would say that this event takes place in the shadow of these announcements, but that shadow is so immense and long-standing. Uh, in the words of the poet and thinker Billy Ray Belcourt, uh, so many within community are interminably grieving the scale of Indigenous death that constitutes this country. Uh, if you feel that you cannot watch or participate in this event at this time, know that it will remain live on YouTube for future viewing. And know also that we come together in a spirit of celebration of thought word and community tonight, uh, tempered as it may naturally be. Uh, the writers joining us are an incredible group. I'll introduce them individually before the readings begin. And uh, following that, there'll be time for conversation both amongst the poets and uh, of course with you folks. So over the course of the evening, as uh, and if questions occur to you, please do feel free to put them just in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, feel free to also chat amongst yourselves in the chat. Uh, at the end of the event, I will send copies of presumably all the pleasant things that you've said about tonight's participants along to them. So they also have a record of that as well, just in case they are very focused on the readings themselves. Uh, I should also point out that all of the incredible books that we'll be discussing uh, and reading from this evening are available from McNally Robinson Booksellers. Uh, they're available in person. They're also available over the phone or online. And uh, we courier locally within Winnipeg and can ship nationally and internationally uh, via Canada Post as well. So I'll throw up some information about that in the chat also. Uh, that is more than enough for me right now. So I'm gonna make myself small and bring up images of some of the participants uh, so you can look at them rather than me while I tell you a little bit more about them. So our first reader tonight, Hannah Green, is a writer and poetry editor at uh, the wonderful Winnipeg-based magazine, Contemporary Verse 2. She is currently working on her first book of poetry, Xanax Cowboy. Molly Cross Blanchard is a white and Métis writer living on unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and uh, Tis uh, Tislawatooth territories, AKA Vancouver. She works as the publisher at Room, Molly's debut poetry collection, Exhibitionist, which is published by the wonderful people at Coach House Books, is described as sorry, not sorry, confessionalism, written against the shame put on us by others and the shame we put on ourselves. Dallas Hunt is Cree and a member of uh, Wapa Mississippi, uh, Swan River First Nation in Treaty 8 territory in Northern Alberta. Dallas's first children's book, The uh, Beautiful Oasis in the World Famous Bannock, was published by Highwater Press and nominated for several awards. His new book, Creeland, which is published by Nightwood Editions, is concerned with notions of home and the quotidian attachments we feel to those notions, even across great distances. Our final poet tonight, uh, Selena Bowen, is a white settler in Nihio, writer living on the traditional unceded territories of uh, the Musqueam, Tislawatooth and Squamish peoples. She received the 2017 National Magazine Award for Poetry and was a finalist for the 2020 CBC Poetry Award. Selena's debut poetry collection, Undoing Hours, which is also published by Nightwood Editions, considers the various ways we undo, inherit, reclaim, and relearn. So without further ado, I'd like you to all join me in welcome, giving a very warm welcome to our first reader and to all the readers this evening. Hannah Green. Hello. Um, being strongly encouraged by everyone I know to never use that photo and um, seeing like that, that felt good for me and Molly encouraged it. So 
Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be reading two parts from Xanax Cowboy tonight. Uh, no Xanax, no Cowboys, but um, they're both, they're both parts. Okay. Um, rock and roll. Um, here we go. Like any girl in her mid-twenties, I think Montreal might save me. Like a Heather O'Neill character, I'd learned to speak in similes so devastating the pigeons on the windowsill would weep. I move into an apartment with high baseboards and stained glass windows. In the winter, the living room is cold and I find holes in the stained glass stuffed with paper towels to keep the snow out. A Heather O'Neill character would make wet angels on the hardwood floor. She would shiver in her tattered nightgown and grind her ass against the cold shoulder of our cruelest season. A Heather O'Neill character would embrace the cold like a flea-covered cat and dress it in a velvet bow tie. I'm getting my MA in English at Concordia. Sometimes I go to class, but mostly I don't. When I do, I bring wine and a thermos, give seminars on books I didn't bother to read. The professor calls me into their office and confronts me. You seem like you don't want to be here. I tell them about my broken windows, and after that, they treat me like an injured bird. Men wink at me in a language I don't understand, and I smile. It's embarrassing how lonely I am. Entertaining men with nicotine mouths because I cannot entertain myself. A Heather O'Neill character would never say such a thing because solitude is the best friend she smokes cigarettes on the fire escape with. Solitude is the nude photo of herself she masturbates to. On the roof of the apartment across the street, there's an injured pigeon and I think about scooping it in my palms building a shoebox nest and repairing its wing with a splint made from a tampon applicator. I think about becoming a Heather O'Neill character, skipping down the street and returning my uh, library books in a hard shell suitcase, wearing a tutu to the bar and leaning against the jukebox where men with crooked teeth line up with quarters for the chance to dance with me. I think about how I'll respond to emails from friends asking how I'm doing in Montreal. I am so well you could drown in me. My life is so sweet here, it would rot your teeth. Um, so that's one. So I'm gonna read a, uh, another section now um, <clears throat> to my grandparents watching on YouTube. I'm sorry. Um, also, I've been sober since November 1st, 2020. I comment on the dead bird by the gate. The next day it's absence. That's good, my boyfriend says, the stray cats aren't going hungry. Every night he says, please come to bed, and every night I laugh and say soon. It's a joke that neither of us find funny. There's no punchline. Comedian shrugs and takes a sip of water before a silent room. There are only white lines I inhale till I'm scraping snot from rolled dollar bills and putting it back in my nose, remembering how once I saw my cat puke and eat it. Still hungry. I don't know how to explain the vacancy when nothing is left. Perhaps empty like a motel that is far from the interstate, like Norman Bates who goes on living long after the protagonist has died. I remember a children's movie where owls steal the sun and everything is wet and inexplicably flooding. Maybe it's a bit like that. I am jealous of friends who only eat dead birds on weekends who have coping skills like cans of tuna. I spent my savings account on dead birds and don't have the feathers to prove it. <clears throat> when I hear my boyfriend rise to get ready for work, I pretend to be asleep on the couch. He sighs and pulls a blanket over me before taking his dog to the park, a plastic bag in his pocket to gather her shit with. The bag will live on forever in the landfill, but I can't keep living like this. Imagine watching the same horror movie every night, thinking this time, maybe this time she's gonna make it out alive. I remember what a veterinarian once said holding my cat on his cool table. You should be able to feel the ribs, but not see them. My ribs stick out like rows of excuses. It's not me, it's my addiction. I can't come to the phone right now. 
That's an excuse when my nose is bleeding and I'm screaming at my mother. When I miss my nephew's birthday and the special cupcake he made for me. I can't come to the phone and you're speaking to a colony of stray cats, flea bitten and giggling, chanting dead birds, dead birds, dead birds. Again, to my grandparents, my apologies. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to read. And uh, I'm gonna pass it over to, uh, to Molly now. Oh, oops, I hit the wrong button. Um, oh. Oh, Hannah, I haven't heard you read for so long and it's, you're doing it different now. It's very intense and beautiful and oh, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, okay, hi, I, my name is Molly Cross Blanchard. Um, thanks, John, for the introduction. I wrote Exhibitionist um, with Coach House Books um, and I am coming to you today from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, thank you, McNally. Thank you again, John, for having us. Um, I, I did my undergrad at the University of Winnipeg and spent a lot of time at McNally um, with Hannah, um, us and our crew from creative writing class. Um, and so this is very special to me. I wish I, wish I could be there in person. Um, where I watched so many other amazing writers launch their books. Um, and I also see there are some, um, some people here that um, Hannah and I had class with. Uh, Bev, David, Marissa, thank you for coming. Um, it's a small crew tonight, but it is mighty. Um, and also, uh, as always, thanks to my tour mates, Selena and Dallas. Um, very grateful to read with you, as always. Um, there's a lot of pain and trauma in the media right now. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, I hope you take care of yourself. Um, and I've tried to choose poems to read that are a little, um, a little more tender tonight. I'll start with, um, with an older poem, First Time Smudge. It takes eight matches, a burnt thumb, and a quick Google search to light the sweet grass braid mom scored for me from an elder at work. Always use matches, she said. Spirit likes matches. I don't have the abalone shell or eagle feather, water and air. So I just hold them in my mind, cup the smoke to my face, my left chest, down the fronts of my calves to my feet. I noticed too late, I forgot to change the Spotify playlist to something more traditional. Hopefully spirit likes Jimmy Eat World. I think about the word smudge while I coax the smoke into each corner of my bedroom, the way it might mean a smeared mark, like how the message from him apologizing for the women in my bed was a smudge on my inbox today. The way I felt when I read it, a smudging of my cool front, I want to think of the word smudge as wiping away, but to soil is simpler than to cleanse. And I'm afraid all this smoke can't smudge his spirit from the air here. I open the window, cough, an acrid cough into the dark. I notice too late. The Google article said to keep it open from the very beginning. This next poem is my Ode to Winnipeg, which of course I had to read tonight. Winnipeg, you're so pretty in the dark. Monuments lit from underneath to mask the pox in your marble. You hoard freezy sleeves and cigarette butts in your snowbanks when you know May will spit them into the streets and that's a symptom of insanity. Tell my friends I can't talk today. I'm moving through you with the open-coated lilt of someone already too cold to care. I've made a Quincy of my chair and this cup of Lipton tea. Let loose a little icicle over my ex's windshield so he knows I'm thinking of that girl that time in my bed. Winnipeg, I'm mad at you. My spine's a necklace of knots and it must be your fault. Do you like it when McLean's calls you on your shit? Does it make you want to be a better city? I bet you were smoking dope under the bleachers when Toronto scored the game winning goal. You'll be my bridesmaid when I marry Vancouver. Dr. Phil says middle children get neglected. Do we hug you enough? 
I'm sorry we keep putting band-aids over your asphalt wounds. I don't blame you for taking out my front struts. My New Year's resolutions are underneath the snow pile in the Costco parking lot. I buried them there after exchanging a midnight kiss for weed in your underground pub. Winnipeg, let's get forked under the bridge and laugh at people who make moving through you look easy as if they can't see those cracks in the ice on the red. And this one's my Tinder poem. What do you do? When you brush your teeth, do you get toothpaste on the mirror or are you a cyborg? Do you sleep naked or do you suck? Have you ever talked to the moon as a friend? Where did you grow up? Did it have a water park? Did the fair come through every August and did you piss yourself a little on the ring of fire? Is this haircut negotiable? Do you have roommates? Are they also blonde? Do you and your roommates sit knee to knee on a futon drinking pale ales and watching The Office while someone pours queso over a plate of Tostitos? Sorry, that was pointed. Have you been on the apps long? Have you ever swiped left on every nice looking person because you felt undeserving of love? What time of day do you masturbate mostly? Do you think about an authority figure or a lesser mortal? Am I the kind of person who could make you hard? Don't answer that. White liquor or brown? Fucking or friendship? Land back or reconciliation? Do I intimidate you? I know you can see my areolas through my t-shirt and yes, it's a power move, but I really am a sweet girl. Just ask my therapist from when I was 12 and too anxious to have sleepovers. Did you go to therapy when you were 12 or does your spirit stay in your body when you talk to your birth father on the phone? How many pets have died since you were old enough to feel that perverse loss? What were their names? Where on your body are they tattooed? Are you going to let me live my life or are you going to sit me at a dinner table with your sexist friend, Stephen? Are you going to be pissy if I write poems about how much sex we are or aren't having? And if I say, okay, then I'll write about my other boyfriends. Will you throw a beer glass, not at my head, but not not at my head? Will your mother look at me across the yard at the engagement barbecue with pity all over her face because she knows she raised a shit bag and hopes there's something I can do about it? Should we make out? And this last poem is the, the second last poem in the whole book and it's called, What If? But if I abandoned my life to live on a boat, but if the boat could drive itself, but if I picked you up at a port in Regina, but if we sailed in circles on the prairie like kind pirates, but if we went below deck and made a baby, but if you braided and unbraided my hair every day. But if the apocalypse came when we were under a tarp with our dicks out. But if the people we loved most were bobbing by and we scooped them up in a big net. But if they each possessed a necessary skill for survival. But if we learned to like the taste of raw pike. But if I was so happy I never questioned it. But if money was a thing you stuffed the pillows with. But if you held me each night while the big flood rocked us to sleep. But if our baby was between us with their eyes open and their hands on our faces. But if our baby took care of us in our old age. But if our baby got old. But if we died and came back as beavers. But if we built a home for our old baby and they built a fire in it while we watched from the bank across the straight holding paws. But if. While we were holding pause, you tickled my palm with one dull claw and said, this was the plan all along. Thank you. And I'm going to pass the torch to Dallas Hunt. Oh, we can't hear you, Dallas.
did hear you for a second there and then we lost you again. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, let me try my headphones one more time and if they work, great. Uh, this all worked before this. I don't know what is going on, but let's see. Sorry. Okay, Siri, get out of here. Nobody wants. It. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start my timer. Um, and yeah, uh, so tansi ni te temtek Dallas Hunt ni te gasan nia o manehiel egua wapasu sapio tinia. So hi everyone, my name is Dallas Hunt, and I'm Cree and a member of Swan River First Nation, which is in Treaty Eight territory in northern Alberta. And I don't know why I'm wearing these headphones. My mom is Cree and my dad is uh, something like Brit, Scots, Swedish, that kind of thing, you know, a sort of amalgamation of stuff. I wanted to give a, a shout out to both McNally and John, especially for all the organizing that uh, they do. And I've worked with John numerous times in the past and it's always a uh, great person just to work with and it's, is phenomenal, but also to uh, Molly uh, for the organizational work that they've done, but also to my fellow uh, readers, uh, Selena um, and Hannah for all the work that they do as well and the beautiful poetry that they produce. So I'm going to get started. I think that I probably took a minute there. Uh, so everyone can hear me okay? This is fine? Or not so much? I can try my headphones again if it doesn't work, but um, yeah, let's just Let's just see how this works. Okay, so I'm going to read a few poems and uh, yeah, and I can't wait to turn it over to Selena. So here we go. Uh, a lot of these poems I haven't read before. And so some of them are uh, a bit more vulnerable and the content might be a little uh, difficult, but um, I, I just wanted to read them for the first time. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to uh, do so. So the first poem I want to read is called Comfort. So comfort, nothing ever feels good when you're diagnosed as crazy, feels nothing, a running litany of things I'm irrationally afraid of, unidentified sounds, being raptured, reciprocating love, becoming a serial killer, hugs that linger, my teeth falling out, fruit flies, feeling better. What if in the attempt to flourish, we throw surviving out the window, off the Lionsgate Bridge, down chasms? What if at the bottom of a chasm is where intimacy lies? Don't think I'll survive the plunge, baby, with bath water. I've gained weight, so a friend asks me if I remember when I used to uh, have cheekbones. I don't, but I hope to someday smile like I do. The next poem I wanted to read is called the Cree word for uh, careening. Uh, when your book is called uh, Creeland, it's hard to find um, <laughs> uh, the poem when you search it up in a PDF because Cree comes up a hundred times, but uh, just one second. Okay, I have it here. So this poem is called The Cree Word for Careening. Thin air during the day prior to 4.30 p.m. I am a particle, dust dispersed, stars the mother I'll never see again, diaspora, my clinking bones, my teeth are galaxies, asteroids clamoring together. My molars, the afterlives of solar flares, the freeing residues of stars letting go of being undone. What else is there to do when you're a star but let go? I'm the rising tides, the moon's orbit, my waistline. Flooding is love to be made and overflowing. Pipes bursting, a comet with no end. In a word, intergalactic, a shooting star crestfallen and plummeting, faint, fatigued, and regretful, but willing to fall again. What's the Cree word for careening? And the next one I'm going to read is actually a poem that I'm actually not a big fan of in the collection, but I had a friend say that they liked. And so I thought I would read it now and I've never read it uh, in person. So um, this one is called Scraps from Summer Visits. Scraps from summer visits. When I was eight years old, my cousin asked me earnestly, did our ancestors wish on shooting stars? Soft serve ice cream from the egg fair, the taste of cold cream in our mouths. Do our ancestors wish on shooting stars? He asked the following summer. I shrugged, changed the subject, but wanted to tell him so lucky are we that the moon loves us all. 
Next summer, Inglewood, a row of townhouses north side of Edmonton, my cousin staying with us for four days, spending most of that time in his conchies, stated to me plainly, self-assured, our ancestors are shooting stars. And the next poem I want to read is called um, uh, It's called Louise, and this is for my um, great-grandmother, Louise. So Nichapan was born with one eye and one kidney. For her grandchildren, she worked her brittle fingers into dough, into, into the edges of fires, into frost-lined canopies, into dust she'd knead with flour and bake for us, awasasak. Bannock weighs heavy on bones, she'd say, and lick the lard from fingers that cracked with love and life for ancestors that linger, welcomely, and for the ancestors to come. For white men, Nichapan has awasis tattooed, sorry, not awasis, has awas tattooed on her knuckles, her back hunched, vigilant, yet carrying herself with that looseness of being that glides on and with the wind, Nichapan strikes with the fury of a thousand anthes whispering, there is no word for benevolent white men in my language. And I think I have time for maybe one more. So let me do that. This one is called Porcupine 2. My cookum's rib cage plumage wrapped around a plum, a skeleton of barbed wire and electricity bones that catch in the throat of those that wish any of her grandchildren ill, cartilage that bends but doesn't break, bends, bends, and bends until the slack tightens up and slaps white men in the face, cumulus cloud that rumbles gray, battering the side of houses, gale winds that utter cree like a caress and a threat, whisper like a brick wall, a stum, if you know what's good for you. Hi, uh, hi, hi, everyone. Thanks for thanks for listening to me read. Thanks. Um, so I think the uh, our next reader is uh, not that I think I know uh, our next reader is uh, a, a personal favorite of mine, uh, Selena. Um, yeah, it's a great collection, and um, uh, you should go buy it. So Selena, I give the the floor <laughs> is yours. Hi, hi. Thank you, Dallas. Um, yeah, I mean, that was incredible. I'm so happy that you read the um, the summer poem. That's one of my faves and it was really lovely to get to hear it in your voice. Um, so yeah, Tansei's Selena Tsiga san, Otse no Tue Esue o Nukum, we are Oche Waterhen Lake, Askiagan, Egwa Namasam, we are Oche Flying Desk Askiagan, Ot Egwa Nigawe We Munasquiao. So um, I just always like to start in language learner and practice. Molly and Dallas have heard this spiel many a time, but um, I like to practice introducing myself. Um, so I grew up with my mom on the unceded traditional lands of the Couchin people. And on my dad's side, my Cookham is from Waterhen Lake First Nation, and my Namusum is from Flying Dust First Nation, which are two reserves in uh, northern Saskatchewan near each other. Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a tough few days, I won't lie. Um, sometimes things just hit you at certain certain intervals and that definitely happened for me yesterday. Um, but I'm so grateful to be here with this amazing intimate crew of folks who are spending their Friday with us. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, and yeah, of course, a huge, huge, Hannah, I've never heard you read and that was absolutely stunning. I'm completely obsessed and I can't wait for your book. Um, and Molly and Dallas, you know that I'm, you know, forever stands. I, I just you know, can't get enough. <laughs> and I'm so grateful to be doing this tour with all of you. And then, of course, a huge, huge thank you to John um, and everyone at McNally. Um, I feel I just felt like the love from Winnipeg. And that's really lovely. It's been obviously kind of shitty not being able to like actually physically go on tour. So even just getting to do these these virtual things means a lot and it's really nice to just get a space to celebrate a little bit. Okay, that's enough uh, rambling. <laughs> um, I have been, I was thinking a lot about what I wanted to read because my book, um, I have quite a few longer poems in my book. So sometimes for readings, it's a little hard to pick the shorter ones. So I'm actually going to read one of my longer poems tonight. Um, and it is called, um, 
So I'm just putting on my timer also. <laughs> uh, minimal pairs are word holding hands, words holding hands. And I haven't read this poem in a while. Um, and so, yeah, I haven't read it enough and I wanna share it. It, changed, it has changed a lot since it, I first published it and since I first read it, so. Um, and I'll just say for context, minimal pairs are sort of the first thing that I kind of like learned on the internet about the Hey one about free, um, which is there are two words that sound very similarly, um, but mean different things. And so I probably, you know, as a learner, I mispronounce all the time. So I'm sure I'll stumble a little bit, but that's part of the learning process. Um, so maybe just for context, I'll just show you for those folks who don't have the book. <laughs> it, it's divided like this. So there's kind of like two words and then they, yeah. So just visually as I read. <laughs> okay. Kissig and also. Kissig, she texts, it's refreshing dating a girl who doesn't want to talk every day. It's been two months since I walked on concrete in platform shoes and my heart still hurts. Kissig, the sky. Sometimes love unschools me. It is the smell of juniper, how bracelets sound against each other, a river filling with water. It is a blue mirror and the way the world listens via kissik. So a lynx. I watch my roommate move the soil of one plant to another in the sink. She tells me her dreams while opening cupboards, a pisu in the alley on her way to a party, hair burning. Beso, bring someone. Beso, uh, who speaks their mind at your ex's wedding, shines jokes under the table like a flashlight. Humor is a beacon. You can't catch laughter from someone you don't know or don't like. Nia, me or I. This summer is a planet, and the yous in this poem are exes, missing family, general advice, Nia. This summer is a house party, overhearing someone say that native girl, she was so well spoken. Nia, lead slash go ahead. You Nia me to the place they found his body, your own body, a lit window a quiet x-ray. Words vibrate worlds if you listen. Nianan, us. I took a photo of the window, the snow, none of Notui. I hold Nianan in my mind, his face in mine. Days fit into the holes where my wisdom teeth once were, blood, nerve. Nianan, five. If I dream polysynthetic, if I dream the Hewewen, will I finally speak, will Nukum hear me? I miss knowing her in this world by Nianan years. So it's my friends who teach me to stop remaking all my bead lines. It's a guy again, a nail for building. In grade six, I snuck a tin of blue eyeshadow to school, fingers blue from touching myself. In my apartment, Sagaigana, push back out of the floor, rip holes where we walk. Sagaigan, a lake. My mother's microwave doesn't have time, just two neon dots stacked and blinking. So much dust on her bathroom blinds, it forms a sagaigan, a horizontal universe of skin cells, pollen, hair. Gona, snow. Outside Esso, Kona starts rounding itself up in my ears, the world gone sideways. When anxiety stretches up into your body, look around and ask yourself, are you safe? Kona, put it in the fire. You slept in a sleeping bag, rolled your jacket into its own hood and prayed it wouldn't rain. Tonight, Kona, star guts and the space between your fingers where night appears. Oma, this. Today, my heart is a staircase. I am incapable of the love others deserve. Oma is my apology, a gas station on the way to visit Notui, the room you and I once shared. 
Ota here. Isn't it funny how we can remember and forget at the same time? Sorry, isn't it funny how we can remember at the same time we forget? Ota, where we first hold hands, become the mouth's words camp inside for a while at least. So, hi, hi, thank you. <laughs> All right, are we all coming back? Um, folks watching, can you see all of us now or just one of us? You can see all of us. Okay, great. Oh, Selena, I'm so happy you read that poem. I love that poem. That was amazing. Um, yeah, okay, so I think we're gonna do like a little chat here. Um, if anyone has, has questions for us or things that you want us to to talk about, feel free to throw that up in the chat. That's great. I was gonna say I, I stumbled because of my my edits. Like I haven't read that poem since I went back in and edited it. I mean, I read it aloud to myself, but I haven't actually like performed it. So that's always so funny, you know, when you like stumble over your own words. <laughs> I was actually thinking, cause I know you said you were going to think of questions to ask us about the poems we read. And I was like, okay, I need to think of one for Selena. <laughs> and that was the question I was going to ask because mm -hmm. I know that poem was published in Room, right? Yeah. Like years ago. Yeah, so yeah. I was going to ask like, what, what are the major edits you made to that poem since it was since it was published, like what what things did you feel needed to be changed before it like appeared in the book? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. To be honest, I don't I don't really remember like all of them, all the changes that I made. I think they were like pretty subtle. The shape of the poem stayed the same, um, and it was a poem that I started writing just kind of experimenting and partly to teach myself some of those words. Um, and it's it's the only place in the poem actually that I include translations for the Nehewewin. And I did that purposely um, because I was hoping that that poem would sort of mirror that learning. And especially at that time that I was um, working on that poem, uh, I hadn't I hadn't like memorized those words yet. I didn't know those words. So, but in terms of how it changed, yeah, I mean, you you actually Molly <laughs> Molly edit, helped edit that poem. Um, and you, I remember you like grilled me for the end of the poem and I just, you were like, push harder, let go. And I tried, I did try, I promise you I tried, but I just, it's hard sometimes when you're trying to like land a poem or end a poem, oh, it just, it's so tough. Do I don't you, remember why I said that. I like, <laughs> <laughs> you need to take everything I say with the tiniest grain of salt. I feel like it landed really hard. So I'm just like feeling Molly was in like a, a weird state at the time, <laughs> in like alternate, like, yeah, that was, cause that was, that was, that was good. It was a crash landing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't imagine it being a bit, uh, stronger end. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm so curious also, cause Dallas mentioned you were talking about scraps from summer visits and you were saying like, you don't like that poem. I'm so, I, I kind of want to ask people like what poem in their cl collection or what poem, Hannah, that you're working on that you're finding like either you, you're, it's just not there for you or something or that you're still, I don't know. I'm just curious to hear why that poem for you, you don't like as much. Cause I find it really interesting that poems I don't like personally often end up being like people who read or are like listening and it ends up being their favorite work. And that always is so interesting to me. I don't know. I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts on that. Yeah, I, uh, I think a crash landing is still landing. So at least we're <laughs> back on the ground in a way. Um, but you're right, Selena. I feel like some of my favorite poems in the book, or personal favorite poems, not that I think the work that I do is, you know, whatever, but, you know, it is sometimes you write a poem and you're like, hey, I think I, I think that's a good poem, or I, I, I think I did, you know, stick the landing on that one. Uh, rarely, if ever, does, do people bring up those poems to me, ever. It's a, and I find that to be so fascinating, because I'm like, no, no, no. Like I, I stuck that one. Like you gotta, like you gotta bring that up. 
And so um, it was my friend, I think Jesse Lawyer, who's also an amazing poet and uh, you know, uh, just does a lot of great work generally, was like, um, I really like that scraps from summer visits. And I was like, really? Like, okay. And, and that's not a comment on Jesse. It's, it's, it's more of a comment on me being like, or, or this whole process being like, we, you know, as soon as the text is outside of our sort of hands or grip or whatever, we, people get to engage with it, how they see fit and they like stuff that we might not. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's hard. My, I think my least favorite poem in my collection, which is a weird thing to say is, um, no, I don't know. There's so many poems in here I don't like, so let's. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm gonna give. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll give the floor to somebody else. Okay. Well, okay, that's funny, Dallas, because that's also Selena. Is that not your one of your favorite poems in Dallas? Yeah, it is. I know. It's. So I funny. remember you texting me. We had both gotten Dallas's book, and you texted me that poem, being yeah. like, "How does he do this?" <laughs> So it's like, that is a raved about poem, just so you know, you're allowed to not like it, but it is a raved about poem. That's incredibly sweet. Thank you <laughs> so much. Really, that really makes me feel uh, more confident in my... Uh, <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. What Hannah, are you um, working on any sticky poems in your collection right now? And if you are, how are you... Yeah, like, like, like a yeah. child with like a popsicle. Um, yeah, I Molly knows about this one. Um, I'm in, I wrote, uh, there's gonna be a play. <laughs> um, yeah. It's called uh, Cocaine Cowgirl versus Xanax Cowboy and um, nobody gets it. And um, I've spent at this point, like I wanna say 40 hours on this fucker. And uh, I won't let it, I won't let it go. Like, and I, I show it to so many people and everyone's like, I don't, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. And I like keep trying again and people are like, I don't know what's happening, but uh, it's, it's going to be, it's, it's happening. It will happen. Molly, Molly is nodding. She like, she knows I'm going to make it happen. But um, yeah, I just, I have, I have a lot of sticky poems. Um, but that'll be my number one would be uh, the, the play that I'm trying to write cocaine cowgirl versus uh, Xanax cowboy. Yeah, that's a really cool one. That's like a that's like a carnival poem. Like there's so much happening and there's like so much to look at and take in. It, and it really does feel like you're like at a carnival. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I think my favorite thing right now is that there's actually a question in the Q&A directed at Hannah. And it's uh, what was the inspiration behind Xanax Cowboy? And underneath it, it says John Taves is going to answer this question live. So John, let it, it, come on up. <laughs> we need to, oh no, there's no open. Uh, sorry, my bad. That's, but, uh, that's from David John Rigoli. Answering for me? Sorry. Sorry, John is answering that for me. No, no, I think it was just like a Zoom doing its its thing. But I guess what, all I wanted to do was just pose that question to you from the from the Q and A, which I think the person says. Uh, oh, sorry, what was it? What was it again? That was the, that question was from David Bergoli. Hello, David. Hi, and David. That was, and that was um, what was the inspiration? What's the inspiration behind Xanax Cowboy? Okay. So I think, as Lana Del Rey would say, I was I was in the winter of my life. Um, not doing great. I wasn't sure what I was going to do like career wise. Um, and, um, I, I went with, with competitive, uh, online solitaire, um, to, as, as a career goal briefly. And I had to make uh, an account to do it. And, uh, Xanax Cowboy popped into my head and the uh, username was available. Um, and then I just realized I was a Xanax cowboy and um, it, it spiraled from there. And um, the, sol the solitaire didn't see it. And you got your domain name, xanaxcowboy.com? Yeah, so my boyfriend was trying to get a website domain and like all the ones he wanted were really expensive. So just to piss him off, I got xanaxcowboy.com for $2.99. Um, <laughs> just to piss my boyfriend off. So I do, there's no, please don't go to it. There's nothing on it. I made it in like three minutes. please don't go to it but i do have that domain. oh my god that's too good yeah. so affordable so 
print my book? Yeah, I mean, if people are interested in my work, you can go to www.dallashunt.gov.biz. And uh, it's, uh, I'm kidding. That's a terrible <laughs> that URL. That I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that does not exist. I'm sure it exists now. Some Russian bot already got to it. But um, yeah, sorry. My bad. <laughs> I was just going to say, Hannah, I could not unmute myself for some reason. I was like, I'm going to go there right now. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, that's hilarious. Molly, do you have any poems that you still feel like you would want to go back to? Or do you feel good about your collection now? No, I don't feel good about my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Winnipeg it's brilliant. One, oh, thanks. Yeah, um, the Winnipeg one I read tonight um, feels weird. Like it's not one that I would ever read at another event. Like I just read it because this is our, our Winnipeg event. Um, and I think because I, I wrote it a really long time ago, like I wrote it when I was still living in Winnipeg, which is probably five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so any of, any of those really old poems that still kind of like slid into the book um, don't feel right to me. I think just because they were written before, I think I found really found my stride um and then the other one that I've talked about that I think is always changing is Dear Mr. Decker which is like my long poem about my sex ed teacher that Hannah desperately tried to help me fix and you really did get me like most of the way but it 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 still feels wrong somehow it's a good poem it is a good poem <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know I think just because it's so big like the the concept is so expansive that it just will never feel finished but yeah I was gonna say I like what you said about like earlier poems because I I've had conversations about this with um folks also in the audience Brandy <laughs> um just about and and just about like how, you know, a poem can kind of timestamp like a moment that you're in at that particular time. And so similarly to, I don't, I don't write in a journal or diary, but I can imagine the excruciating sort of pain of returning to like a past self sometimes and being like, oh my gosh, that's where I was then. I feel like that sometimes is the case with poems and like as our voice, you know, like develops and changes that those like earlier poems that we write just feel so strange in our, like to read them feels, it feels like strange in your body. Uh, at yeah. least I find that. I, d I definitely have poems where I, yeah, I just feel like I continually want to rework them, but I just, I ran out of time. <laughs> I was like, you know what, this is, this is what I got um, to some extent. But it's also, it's hard because there are also sometimes those poems that you just can't I don't know. They're sticky. Like you just can't quite get them right. Or like the landing is just off or you never totally land, I guess. And or then they go to the poem graveyard. graveyard. Sorry? And then they go to the poem graveyard. Yeah. In your Google exactly. box. Yeah. It's exactly. always. But then sometimes like for me, I had one and like it went there and like I pulled it out five years later and it's like one of my favorite poems now. And it's like, it literally has like three lines from the original, but I just like wasn't ready at the time. Like, I think there are poems that we try and write at a time in our lives when it's just like, it's not, it's not time yet. Um, then we need to grow more and learn more. And then it's like, oh, okay, now, like, now I can land the poem plane. <laughs> the way that I tried one word, I couldn't come up with it in time. <laughs> the poem plane. The, the plume? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think of Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Molly. sorry, Molly, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, speaking of um, landing the poem plane, we have a, a question from Sharon Paul Rupry, um asking, how do you know when a poem is done? Who that's wants to a, take that one? That's one of the hardest questions, I feel like, is because you could, you can whittle a poem down for, you know, forever. As, as Hannah was just saying, it could be, it could be years, right? It's, you, you revisit it. I, yeah, I don't know. I just get a particular feeling from poems. And then if you get, if you get that ending, I feel like sort of what we've been talking about the whole time is like sticking the landing, you feel the landing, do you know what I mean? And even if it's a little curt or abridged or all of these things, it still feels right. Whereas there are other ones where you could meander for, you know, and sometimes I struggle with, you know, I, I want to fit everything into a poem. I'm like, 
like, hey, you know, I need to talk about this and talk about that and everything's going to go in there. And sometimes that's the wrong approach. And I know it's a cliche, but sometimes less is more, you know, so I don't really know. I, 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 I really appreciate that question, but I also think it's one of the hardest questions in terms of you know, moving forward with a poem or collection or something like that. My answer to that question is like, I, I always tend to take it like one step too far. So the last line or the last couple of lines usually end up getting chopped. And I don't know why, maybe just like to be safe that you're like covering everything you need to cover. But I find that when I'm writing a poem, I've already gotten there before I think I've gotten there. And then whatever is sort of like the excess on the end is kind of um, just extraneous. And you can, when you get rid of it, you actually end up with, with a punchier ending that maybe doesn't give away all your secrets, if that makes sense. I, I think too, sorry, I, 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 uh, I it, it's actually really interesting talking to the three of you about this because you're all poetry editors, right? You've all edited poetry in some capacity. And mm -hmm. so, uh, which I haven't done, but it, you all have this sort of insight or this ability to, you know, back out from a poem and just really start to get at the nitty gritty of stuff. And I'm uh, super amazed by that. I don't think I could do that. I will say that having had the privilege of having Molly read my my manuscript prior to it coming out, she is very, Dallas exactly what you're describing. She's very good at that. She's very good. Like you're very good at coming out and then being like, like it astonishes me. Some of my poems, I was like, this is shit. I will never get it good. The suggestions you gave to me for those pieces, like I at least got them to a place that I was like, okay, I can have this be out in the world and not feel completely embarrassed. And I learned how to do that from Hannah. Because Hannah did that for me first. Wow. You feel like I sent Molly some poems and I was like, she gave me some suggestions and I was just like, blew my mind, like fixed my poems. It's amazing. Um, and then for me, like end of a poem, like um, basically I always, my first line and my last line never changes. I've got a poem, then I'm good. If I don't have my last line, it goes to the graveyard. Um, so basically when I'm writing a poem, I always have my first line, I like my last line. So that keeps me contained and all I have to do is get there. Um, so if I don't have that last line, like usually the last line is what comes to me first and then I'm just trying to get to it, if that makes sense. Um, like well, just, you know, you're supposed to like, surprise yourself, but I never surprise, I hate surprises. Um, so yeah, I'm just like, I always know exactly where, exactly where I'm going from the beginning. That's so interesting. Wow. I am probably a mix of all three of you, to be totally honest. Um, <laughs> uh, I, to be I, honestly, I'm kind of with Dallas. For me, it's more, and I'm sure it is for you too as well, um, that it's like a feeling. Like I just like, I will, I, it's a hard and tangible thing. Like I, I, I will still know, I'll be like, oh, this poem, people will be like, it's good. But like, I don't feel it yet. And I know there's some sort of intangible thing that is missing from it in there. There were a few poems in the collection that, you know, they still, I'm, they still are in my brain a little bit. Like, I'm like, oh, I never quite got them to feel quite that way. Um, and I think the best feeling is when you do get a poem and you feel it in your body and you're like, yes, okay, I got it. Um, but I'm, it's interesting you were talking about the beginning and the end because Hannah, for yours, because I, I have a long poem in my collection, which was the first sort of like, I would say the intention was for it to be unruly. Dallas was talking about like a poem that you put everything in and I went for it and I tried to put a lot into it. I had someone recently say like, why didn't you break that into like smaller sections? And I was like, well, it's supposed to be messy. Like I wanted it to be, that was the intention. Um, but I had the last few lines for quite a long time. And it was a similar sort of thing. I just kept working towards those last few lines. And I wasn't sure if they actually would end up being the final lines, but they were in the end. And I kept being like, oh, they're not good enough. They're not good enough. And then multiple people were like, no, no, you're good. Just leave it. <laughs> you landed, you, you landed, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, speaking of landing, I think we're, we're almost out of time, which is wild. I'm having so much fun chatting. Should we, I saw there was a few questions or someone had um, yeah, so we have two questions in the Q and A, and somebody in the chat box. Do we want to address one or all of them, or or what Wait, do we think? 
how are folks feeling? I'm fine. I'm happy to answer if, if folks are okay being over for a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. John, is that okay with you? Like, I know you're there in the darkness lurking. It, it is officially <laughs> acceptable to us. Okay, thanks. <laughs> and encouraged. <laughs> Okay, so in the chat, we've got from our friend Rebecca Cook, what are your favorite themes or ideas to write about? Um, so for me, it is um, sex <laughs> and food and body image and love, romance. I like that. That was very distilled. I'm impressed. You get, you, know? you get good at it. You have to answer this question enough and you just <laughs> like, you know. So Selena or Hannah? Dallas. <laughs> 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 shifting it away from you yourself. Okay, I will go. Um, I, I love this question. I find it it sometimes is a challenging question for me just because I feel like I'm often all over the place. But I think for, I mean, maybe I'll just speak to this collection. I definitely think themes and ideas that I was thinking about while writing it. Um, I was thinking a lot about like time and different uh, sort of conceptions and worldviews of time um, and how throughout the collection, like how, how do you manipulate time? How do you think of like think through it in terms of I guess like a poem um, and thinking a lot about language and how that also impacts the way that we see, see the world, um, view the world. And obviously we're all speaking English. So how does that impact the way that we move through, through the world? And also, I also write about heartbreak and love and I am such a little emotional being like, that's really, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. at the core, I think of most of my poems. I'm like, I'm feeling too many emotions. I need to put it in a poem. So yeah, there's more, but that's like the general vibe. Um, I'm writing about addiction and uh, the Wild West and sort of the uh, using the um, romanticization of the Wild West to look at addiction. Um, cowboys, loneliness, um, medication, uh, doctors, um, Zach's cowboy, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's such an interesting question. I, I guess the way I would approach it is that I used to only write poetry that was sort of narrative in nature and that could deal with like a news story and or just like a pop culture reference. Um, I had a poem about Andre the Giant that I really wanted in the collection, but they were like, get this out of here. Like this is a bad poem and it's like, fair enough. Um, but no, 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 I, I you know, uh, I'm fine with it. But the one thing that actually started to happen was, um, I remember someone asked me one time, like, you don't really seem to talk about yourself in poetry as much. Um, uh, maybe you should start writing about yourself a little bit more. And um, so those aren't my, I don't like writing about myself. It's not a favorite theme or idea. Um, but uh, rather, I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is uh, that's how my shifting has sort of, or my thought has shifted is I used to have favorite themes and ideas to write about like news stories or, you know, et cetera. And then I, there are a few poems in there that are intensely personal and I don't know, I, yeah, it, uh, it's, was my favorite thing to do or any of that stuff, but I felt like I didn't write a, I, did, I didn't want to write a volume of poetry that was in no way vulnerable. Do you know what I mean? And so being vulnerable allowed me to work through all these sorts of other things, so. Yeah, we went there. Um, are we going to do these last two questions? How, oh. how does everyone feel? What are the questions? What are the questions? <laughs> okay, Chelsea, our workshop mate, asks, um, you all have wonderfully distinct reading styles. Did these come instinctively? Did you hone them? And what would you call your reading style? Hmm. Um, I love that question. I did theater. I was... <laughs> I'm sorry, that that's really gross. 
that that yeah, totally no, tracks. I made it not gross, Molly. That made it except theater. Yeah, you're so disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I was a three theater kid, um, and I also did <laughs> public speaking competitions. <laughs> you you did too. You did too. Better and better. <laughs> I was selected in so, grade eight for a public speaking competition. <laughs> Oh, Hannah. <laughs> I was too aggressive, yeah. they told me. You were too what? I was too aggressive. <laughs> when I spoke, I got too aggressive. Like, you know how they give you that, like, stand? My big stick yeah. that I did all through university is, like, I wouldn't go behind it. I would, like, come out in front of the stand. And they were like, you're way too aggressive. Like, calm down. That was that was why I lost nationals was because I, I stayed behind the podium and I wouldn't go out. They said I should have walked in front of the podium and I was like what the hell like how do I know that that's what you want anyway um sorry sorry I I do like the casual humble brag of you being at nationals like yeah I made it to nationals did I lose you well, know I, I did, did. okay <laughs> I didn't have a lot going for me in high school but I had that I had, I had nationals <laughs> Um, but yes, anyway, my short answer is I feel like a lot of the times I'm I'm really focused on like enunciation and making sure I'm heard and maybe I like sacrifice some of the emotion sometimes because I'm, I'm trying to like, um, I've got that like theater brain thing of like project to the back of the audience and if they can't hear you, it, then none of it matters. Mm. Um, so I think that's my reading style is like enunciation. I can see it. I'm the only one unmuted right now. I don't know why. Um, I'll, I, I'm so curious to hear what Hannah has to say because you had such an incredible reading and you were reading without reading on the page, I think, correct? It takes me so long to write all of my poems that they're all memorized. It sucks. They're all in there. Um, um, yeah, reading style, I don't know. Um, I like to bounce, I guess. Like when I read, I like to bounce. Like I like to find the rhythm and I like to bounce if that makes sense. Like I like to really find, I don't know. I like I like rhythm, I like going fast sometimes and then slowing down and like taking little breaks. And um, yeah, it depends on the poem too, like how emotional it is. I read like Hannah the Bouncer, thank you, Chelsea. Um, yeah, it really depends like how emotional the poem is. Like I, I chose like a pretty like emotional one. So I read it emotionally, but like I also read a lot of poems that are just like, stupid so I won't read those as emotionally if that makes sense but yeah I hope that does that clarify clar clarify I'm gonna go back on mute because I'm eating a long nib Selena. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah okay also confession I I did I also did theater as a, as a high schooler um, yeah I, really, I was like a pretty quiet person but when I got on stage it was sort of the only place that I felt like I don't know I guess I just liked getting to be someone else <laughs> to some extent um, which reveals a lot about me as a teenager but um so I do have like a background I guess in theater to some extent I mean only up to high school but yeah I I don't know I don't know how I would I guess I just read how I guess I try and read the way that I felt when I was writing it maybe I'll say that um, oh, I think that comes across yeah and I don't yeah I like, so I like hopefully, that hopefully that's a successful endeavor at times but <laughs> whenever I think of you reading I think of um I think of you the your rap poem where you say sorry and I love when you read that poem <laughs> okay Dallas your turn. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think of almost all of my poems as rap poems. I uh, <laughs> just kidding. I, uh, I, I wish I was that talented, but I, um, yeah, I, there, there are a few things I, I just tend to read very fast. And so I uh, have been making a concerted effort to read a bit, you know, to not read as, not read as fast and that's there have been a lot of uh i have a lot of 
interlocutors in Vancouver who are very helpful with this. So, uh, so Cecily Nicholson is somebody whose poetry I greatly admire. And if you've ever seen Cecily read, it's so powerful. And, uh, you know, David Cherry Andy and, and people like that, where I'm just sort of like, this is so wonderfully beautiful. And I hope I get to someday read like this. Uh, and on the flip side of that, just very quickly, is uh, I'm sure we've all been to the poetry readings where there's, especially in Vancouver, where there's like a white dude in a beanie with like a, you know, a beard. And um, I remember one of my first poetry readings, I'm not dissing anybody or their form or whatever, I don't even remember who this was. Uh, but the person like left the venue and then opened the door and then like screamed their poem into the room. And that was their sort of way of reading. And that was one of the first times where I was like, this is why people hate poets. Like <laughs> it truly is like, I, I like, and you're not even yeah. like, and you're not even like explaining why this, why you're doing this, like what, like, <laughs> why you're reading it in this sense. And so part of my approach is just to not be that dude, if that makes sense, <laughs> to, not, to not be the dude who yells into a room. And yeah, to just do your, to do your poetry. Like I, I actually love the way, I love the way you read. Um, yeah, like you just, you like you read, you just read, you read your poem, like you present it, you offer it. There's no beanie man, like screaming. Right? There's no uh, posturing. Pardon? There's no posturing. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, God, I would have loved, I'd love to see that. Mm -hmm. I think too, I kind of have a hot take, which is sometimes I think if you do do that or you have to do that, then maybe that's one of the poems that should have maybe stayed on the cutting room floor. But this is just me speaking, I don't know. But if you have to scream it into a room <laughs> from outside, then I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe the poem isn't doing what you wanted it to do. Tell us what the hot takes. Yeah. How is everyone feeling? I also want to be respectful of the audience as well, because we're already 10, 10 minutes over, I guess. We... I think we just have one. I think we have one more. Okay. We'll do that and then and then wrap up. Depending what it is. Sound good? Yes. Okay. This this question we can always, we can always reject questions. <laughs> no, I'm this, sorry, this just question not... is from, from <laughs> Sweet Bev. Um, Bev asks, has your subject matter changed much since you first started writing poetry? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go first. Um, not really, honestly. The first poem that I remember feeling like this is a real poem was a breakup poem. It was called Forever is a Very Long Time. And it was about how I wanted to break up with my boyfriend when I was 16. And there was a lot of onomatopoeia. I think there was a line that was like, splat goes his heart. <laughs> It was awful, but like same vibe really as what I'm working with now. I'm I've just done a lot more reading since then. <laughs> I'm also writing about like the same. I think Molly can attest. I'm writing about the same stuff. I'm just doing it in a different way, um, and with more research and more reading. Um, for me, it's especially research, like a, like a lot of like a lot of research. Um but also a lot of reading and uh, yeah, yeah. Just like same, same stuff. Like I think that, um, you know, I think we all have things that, uh, that kind of ha haunt us and um, that's what comes out in our writing. And like, it's not that they can't change, but like, I don't know, a lot of us just have the same kind of stuff following us around. Yeah, I agree. That's a great way. You're like haunted by it. I, I, I would say I probably, interestingly, like Dallas was talking about how you sort of turned to the eye. It, it kind of happened similarly, but not in the same way in that I have always kind of been focused or thinking about like identity. Um, and so I would say like as a general overarching theme, that's probably my, the, the biggest thing that I write about. I am, I've mentioned this a few times, but I am planning, I'm hoping to sort of like make a switch in genres because I feel very sort of like and like tired of myself I guess um and I just sort of want to like disappear into a fantasy world of some sort um but 
Yeah, it's interesting. When I started off writing my book, actually, I and a few of the beginning poems, they're in like third person, because I think I wasn't like ready to like own the voice yet. And then as I moved and continued writing, um, I, began, I I think I gained confidence and sort of being like, yeah, this is, this is me. Um, but yeah, that's really exciting. Um, I love when poets switch, like you were saying a fantasy, like, sorry, I'm like, I'm not sure exactly what you're going for, but like, I love when poets switch to a different genre because poets learn language so well and so tight. And like, I find that when a poet switches to a different genre, they can like, they just do it so well because they can drive with, they can drive with emotion. And like, they just know the importance of the and uh, and like all of that, like, like we're so focused so like when we switch to a different genre it's just just beautiful that's super that's super exciting mm -hmm. i'm gonna say i hope that's the case to be honest i haven't practiced my prose in a long time so we're gonna see but i kind of just want to write like a fun book that's my vibe I just want to write like i want cliche stuff to happen i want romance i want like mystery i don't know we'll see <laughs> oh that's awesome I love that. Just fun. Like, yeah, like that's, that's, that's really exciting. I uh, don't have much to add to this. I think as Selena said, I, I just made a shift to the eye and yeah, I think things are going to keep changing and transmogrifying and all that stuff. And yeah, I hope, uh, I hope it's interesting. Uh, if not to anyone else, at least to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this was so nice, you guys. This was really lovely. This is what my Friday really... needed. I feel, yeah. yeah, I feel like a little exhale, which is really nice. Yeah, um, I was really very tired today, and I was kind of worried about how this was going to go, but actually, this has been very nice. Yeah, thank you to this wonderful audience and for all these, like, super thoughtful, beautiful questions. It made the conversation so fun. Yeah, yeah. really good. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be your Winnipeg. Um, guest reader me it means it means a lot this is really a really good time Thank and go you. buy our books from mcnally <laughs> please please mcnally robinson saskatoon cry when, you, cry when you do it <laughs> oh wait that was before anyone else okay no. sorry. <laughs> sorry mom i told on you before that that you cried in mcnally robinson when you saw my book <laughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> i'm so i outed i'm so sorry that's please, okay please go back she, to her cabin anyways thank you <laughs> Everyone knows she's a big crybaby anyway. I, I was just going to say that the spirit of utterly naked capitalism has entered the chat. So I just wanted to uh, mention once again that Nightwood Editions has published these two incredible books, The Undoing Hours by Selena Bone and Creeland by Dallas Hunt, distributed by Harper Publishing. Please get these books. Also, Exhibitionist by Molly Cross Blanchard, published by uh, Legendary Canadian Press, Coach House Books, also available. Uh, Xanax Cowboy, soon to be available, so please do keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, it's not just purely naked capitalism. These are tremendous, wonderful collections, so please do go out and find a copy and get a copy however you can, and we will certainly endeavor to do whatever at we can. Valley. To get the books Where, however you, at McNally. At, at McNally Robinson. Yeah. Only McNally Robinson. <laughs> wherever you can, at McNally Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.